<laughs> I almost forgot to start the recording. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm Miriam, co-founder and CEO of Keto Chow. Check us out at ketochow.xyz. I'm Chris, also a co-founder, president, and the technical guy behind Keto Chow. I'm the one that forgets to turn on the recording. There you go. <laughs> if you're brand new to Keto Chow, we have a couple products that we created to help make doing keto easier. Our main product is a meal replacement shake mix that you can customize to fit the macros that work best for you. We also have some electrolytes that are really awesome when you're doing an extended fast like we're doing right now. We do this live stream to keep you updated with all our keto chow happenings to help us be accountable and stay on track and have you with us on our journey. So thank you for joining us. There you go. I think a kid's outside wanting to watch a movie or something. Will. We'll find anyway, out. so as it says on top here, we are now at 49 hours and 31 minutes. So, but let's get right down to it. We've got Megan Ramos on the line. Hold on. Boom. Hey, it worked. Yes. So far, so good. <laughs> oh, man. I love it when a plan comes together. So, we have Megan Ramos with us. Uh, Megan is the co founder of the fasting method. So, hi, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, I didn't know you guys are doing an extended fast right now. That's so well, cool. Miriam wanted to do it anyway, and so we're just we're doing a seventy-two hour fast. So, awesome. it's it had been way too long since we did one, um, and yeah. So anyway, I figured. It, well, actually, Miriam figured if we're gonna have Megan on, yeah. we might as well do a <laughs> fast. I mean, talking right? about fasting, so we're we're doing a fast. <laughs> It's a sign. My husband told me today that he's not eating until Sunday. Um, and these are like common conversations around our house. Uh, probably sound pretty strange to others, but yeah. he's like, I'm just not going to eat. So don't worry about me. <laughs> so what are you doing? I'm just not eating. Okay. <laughs> well, and it's so funny. In, historically, you know, going back to our ancestors, not eating every two hours was not a big deal. It's just kind of... But we've gotten so far away from that. So, well, our lifestyles change so much. Like food is just so readily accessible to us nowadays. Whereas back then, it, it wasn't. We were certainly driven to hunt and gather and find food for our survival. But we had to work really hard and sometimes go hours, days, weeks, months, yeah. you know, with before getting adequate food. So times have changed now, right next to us at all times, we're surrounded by all kinds of food. Now, Joe just told me that people couldn't hear what you were saying. I got it fixed. So, okay. Can you guys hear Megan now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> he actually texted me. <laughs> and they said Chris is laughing, but we can we can't hear her, so we don't know what she's saying. It was very mm. funny. It was very funny. Okay, and then they said now Thanks. now they can hear you. Okay, so we're back. We're here with Megan Ramos, and <laughs> I, she has sound. And she has sound again. If if there isn't something technical that goes wrong, I'm just not doing it right. Right? Okay, too low for Megan. Uh, desktop. Okay. Anyway, okay. Let's see. So, Megan, back to the thing, is your co-founder of the fasting method, right? Now, yeah. Yeah. explain to me the relationship between IDM and the fasting method. <laughs> okay, so there's, um, it's kind of funny. So, my colleague, uh, Dr. Jason Fung, I, I think a few people watching this have probably heard of him. Uh, we founded Intensive Dietary Management, and there was no thought that went into the name. We were literally sitting in an office, and Jason said to me, what are we going to call our program? And we tossed around a few, a few ideas, and he's like, no, let's use Intensive Dietary Management. And at that point, we just rolled with it. Yeah. Um, but over the last few years, a couple of funny things happened. First, we found out that there is an intensive dietary management program in uh, the UK that did the opposite of what we do. Oh. Um, eat, yeah, eat lots of fruit, eat low fat, and eat like eight times throughout the day. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we we just found that the name didn't really reson resonate with what we were doing which was fasting and people didn't even know what it stood for and it was just a really long and awkward name yeah. but um it's in all of jason's like best-selling books uh it's in all of our recordings that we've ever done and it's 
the name of our company. So the uh, so now we have the Fastly method, which is a branch of, of IDM Inc. Uh, so but our entire program, um, all of our online fasting and behavior coaching and our online self-guided program for fasting and nutrition education is all under the Fastly method umbrella. It's kind of like the Nike story, how they started out with some really goofy name, yeah. like Blue Ribbon. And then, like, they realized that was kind of dumb. And then <laughs> they became Nike. They're, they're, like, really similar. I mean, it could be worse. You could have put chow in your name or something yeah, like that. Yeah, what? People are getting dog food. <laughs> anyway. I think it's Well, thank you. <laughs> Most people are like, that's dumb. Anyway. Okay, so um, let's hear some of your story. So, um, yeah, just can you tell people who you are, what you do, how you got started in all of this? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best to keep it brief because my health journey has been kind of a, a disaster. Uh, my professional and personal lives just sort of came to a cross sort of unknowingly, um, which was kind of cool uh, for me. Um, my personal health, uh, I was a skinny kid, but in hindsight, I was a skinny fat kid. And I know this because I had fatty liver disease and PCOS. I was diagnosed with the fatty liver at 12 and the PCOS at 14, but my BMI was classified underweight. And I wasn't underweight. I was a little sack of fat. Like I wasn't strong and I didn't have a lot of lean mass. Um, I was all fat mass, but I didn't weigh very much. But the doctors were kind of perplexed because I wasn't obese. Um, so they said, oh, well, you'll probably grow out of it. Uh, simultaneously in my teens at 15, I started doing research at a nephrology clinic, a kidney clinic, uh, that Dr. Fung was a brand new nephrologist at, and he was involved in some research there. Uh, so I was partnered up with him. He was, uh, Jason's about 10 years older than me. So he was fresh out of school and we were paired up on some assignments. So that's how we got to know each other. And I worked at that. I love the clinic. I love my patients. I love getting to know everybody. Uh, I loved all of the research. So I hung around there throughout high school, throughout university, and I started working there after school. Um, so throughout my like teens and early 20s, I didn't really uh, see improvements in my health, but it didn't necessarily get worse. And in hindsight, I realized I fasted a lot. But when I ate, I ate like fast food, like pizza and like French fries and chicken nuggets. And your whole family does um, a lot of uh, Italian, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So lots of lots of lots of starch, like lots of pasta and bread. Um, but in my mid 20s, like, I, I started working on this huge prospective research study on diabetic kidney patients. And it got super scary to me. And I thought, Oh, my gosh, Megan, like you have these metabolic issues since you're a kid. They didn't go away like the doctor told you they would. Um, and like your whole family has this horrendous history for type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So you've got to get it together. So I went from like not eating very often because I was too busy socially and with school to Megan, like you got to wake up and eat breakfast and you got to pack your snacks throughout the day and you've got to eat all this damn fruit because that's what the Canadian food guide says. And I started working with one of the most exclusive the dietitians in Toronto. Uh, I started working with a personal trainer. Like I was just so determined to have a different health path than my family. But all of those interventions led me down that health path. So I started to really take my health seriously around 25. Um, and by 27, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and I was definitely morbidly obese. Like, I, I went from just being a skinny fat person to a fat, fat person, uh, and I gained upwards to 80 pounds. Um, so, again, with the career and personal life, crashing um, into one another head on, Jason was getting really frustrated watching his diabetic kidney patients get sick. And he started to wonder, you know, like, what is the origin of type 2 diabetes? Like, yes, yeah, so you get high blood sugar levels, but what actually, like, what is the mechanism that causes blood sugar levels to be high? And he got into studying insulin resistance and doing some research in low carb and in fasting. So in, so I told him about my diagnosis. He talked to me about fasting and low carb. Uh, at the time, it seemed easier to fast than to overhaul my entire diet. Okay. 
because and I I felt like garbage at the time. So I just started fasting. I hated it at first, but I started, <laughs> but I was getting results. So I stuck with it. And about six weeks down the road, I actually started to feel so good on my fasting days that it made me want to change my eating towards low carb too. So I feel good on my eating days. Okay. And within six months, I lost a ton of weight. Um, I've actually kept off 86 pounds for nine years now. Okay, you are a um, unicorn then, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, because there's so many, anyone can do it. Like if I can do it, anyone can. Um, but I reverse the diabetes, the PCOS, the fatty liver. I actually, I like, I go for these fiber scans of my liver every couple of years just because like I love doing exper like self experiments yeah. and my fiber scan like the the um, comment was like absolutely like fantastic like excellent prognosis like there was nothing like no fat no stenosis no nothing um, which was so cool after like a whole lifetime of just having these like really terrible liver results. Oh, yeah. So I started fasting, and then um, our colleagues were really inspired by my results. They uh, let Jason and I start to fast some of our diabetic patients. Amazing results. Like, uh, like within two months, most people were off insulin. Within six months, they were most of them were off of all diabetic meds. So we just started seeing more patients, and then we got so overwhelmed at our clinic. The wait list was about two years long, wow. and there were people trying to come to see us from all over the world, and like Canada's uh, public health, it's a little bit different logistically, so um, so it became difficult, so we started doing some online counseling, and that turned into like an online self-guided program to try to make it more scalable for people who didn't need as much guidance with fasting, like as much like customization. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and then we moved it all online. So we actually had our last clinic day on December 11th, 2019. People asked me if I like secretly knew about COVID. <laughs> back then. You're like, um, but I did. Maybe. <laughs> But yeah, we're, we're all online. Um, so the fasting method, we do fasting education. Um, we do personalized nutrition uh, that's more around real food based. So we help you achieve like carnivore. Um, we help you like do a well-structured vegetarian diet if that's what you're on paleo, low carb, keto. So we really just try to work with the individual, what they're comfortable with and incorporate fasting. I myself um, follow a cyclical ketogenic diet now that I'm at the stage that I am with my health, mm -hmm. um, but a large emphasis on fasting. So our online program has a ton of interactive sessions too. It's not just like flat online info yeah. um, and then we have the fasting coaching and then we just introduced behavior coaching with Dr. Terry Lance so um, so that's what a whole jazz about the uh, about the fasting method and what we've got going on right now okay so wow so online online only so it allows you to see a lot more people mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. you, you guys do a lot of, do you do group sessions at all where you get people together and kind of talk about it yeah, so in our online community, we have these support groups, and they have um, like specialized topics. Uh, so I held one yesterday, like on general insulin resistance. Okay. Um, so the community comes together, they ask their questions, they share their stories. We have women in fasting that focuses on women health, women's health issues. We have like health optimization, fasting for beginners, extended fasting, intermittent fasting, troubleshooting, um, eating strategies. So we have all of these different support groups where everyone can just come together, either myself or one of the, our fasting or behavior coaches uh, run the sessions and like share information and the community um, gets to interact with one another so that's really cool and then our coaching is done in one-on-one -on -one sessions okay so here's a kind of broad question for you why does fasting work so well so good, good question. Um, so a few reasons. Fasting is super affordable. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, you need water and, and salt. And I love your guys' fasting drops. Actually, a lot of people are raving about them this week in the community. We have a lot of nurses. Okay. And 
they're just so easy for them to take to work yeah. uh, and to add to their water throughout the day. So lots of, of cool feedback about your fasting drops. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you can do it anywhere. Like you don't need any special memberships. You don't need any special like diet or you, you can just do it like anywhere. If you're like flying home from Paris and you can, you can decide you want to fast and like, it's so easy. There's no gym memberships, nothing like that. Um, so that's one really great thing about fasting and because of that and the, how economical it is, it's really free to everybody. And we have a great blog, we have a YouTube channel, it's all free. So people don't, um, have the, don't want to pay for our services. Like all the information is out there. Uh, and Jason's written some great books or, and we wrote one called life in the fasting lane. It's it's right there, right? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> but it's not signed. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, well, when I see you guys, okay. when this stuff's over. Um, but from a physiological perspective, too, um, you know, fasting really helps suppress your insulin production and your insulin levels. And that's why I think it's so effective. You know, a lot of people over the last few years come to our program and they're like, hey, you know, we've been doing this great keto diet you know, we've lost 50 pounds and we brought our A1C down to like 5.8%. But like, why can't we lose that last 30 pounds? And why can't we like bring our A1C from 5.8 to like 5.1, like 5.0 yeah. or 5.1, something a little bit more out of range. And when we look at their diet, there's a lot of snacking. And um, when you fa like you factor in how you develop insulin resistance, there's two things. One of them is just high stimulate, like high secretion of insulin. So you definitely get that through a high carb diet that you don't get through a low carb or a keto diet. So that's great. But then you also, uh, the second factor for developing insulin resistance is just the chronic stimulation of insulin, even at a low level. So. Like it, so people think like, hey, I'm not snacking on the potato chips or the pretzels or the Twinkies or donuts. Like, but then they go into snacking on like olives and almonds, macadamia nuts, cheese, meat, and they think that this is awesome. And yeah, heck yeah, <laughs> like that's so awesome, right? Like, what a transformation. But even like when you eat those foods, there's still going to be some insulin secretion. And if you're already like insulin resistant, even a little bit is enough to keep the cycle of insulin resistance going. And what happens too is that the cycle of if you have insulin resistance, it itself drives your insulin levels up. So going low carb, going keto, and not like all circumstances, but in a lot of circumstances, like you're just you're not adding insulin to your system, which is great. But if the insulin resistance is strong, it's still going to drive your own insulin levels up, sort of preventing you from reaching the goals that you want. But when you fast, you're really suppressing that insulin down, and you're forcing it down, and you break the cycle of insulin resistance. So it's no longer there to drive your insulin levels up. And, and we, Jason's got a lot of great blogs up on our website. And he tackles this in his book, The Obesity Code, quite beautifully and very well researched. Um, so I think that's the beauty of fasting. Now, not everybody has insulin resistance to that extent yeah. that they need to to fast. Some, uh, sometimes I hear like the most amazing stories from low carb and keto. And I definitely think it's like the perfect complementary dietary style for fasting. Um, but often like if the insulin resistance and the hormonal imbalances are just that in, intense, uh, the fasting is really something that complements the keto or low carb diet very well to help break the cycle of insulin resistance completely. Yeah. Well, and, uh, it, I've, I've heard you talk before about how you guys kind of arrived at um, fasting as a, as a treatment and it had to do with Ramadan, right? Yes, that was part of the factor. So Toronto is the most multiculturally diverse city in the world uh, in the sense that um, like 50% of our population actually wasn't born in Canada. Uh, so we're very diverse. It's a beautiful place to live. Hey, we um, had fun visiting walk... too. That was great. <laughs> Like you can walk down like one of our main streets and you can hear like 12 different languages. Like it's been such a beautiful place to grow up. But when, when you, so when you have this, um, 
environment, like you, you learn about all different things. You see everything. I, and my best friend growing up, like she was Hindu. And during like uh, sometime in elementary school, like she started to do 24 hours of fasting because that was part of her culture. Yeah. So like fasting for us wasn't necessarily too foreign, like we grew up with it. And like a, a significant amount of our patients in the clinic practice Ramadan. Um, so for 30 days, you go from sunrise to sunset um, without uh, eating anything or even drinking anything. And so in Toronto, like if Ramadan was right now, sunrise is like, 4.30 in the morning at sunsets, like 10 p.m., those are long days. And a lot of the the patients, too, um, like they, they go through Ramadan and their blood pressures come down and their blood sugar levels come down. So we have to adjust their, their blood pressure and blood sugar medication. And then like a month after Ramadan, everything goes back up again once they start going back to their regular eating habits. And it just totally dawned on us, like why, like, why didn't we think of this intervention earlier? Like we always looked at it as a spiritual uh, type of fast, which yeah. it absolutely is. But like, gosh, like the, the health benefits were right in front of our eyes for years and we just never really fully realized it. And then another reason too why we went the fasting route was because where our clinic was located was in a more economically challenged area. Okay. We had a lot of patients on disability. Um, they were given very limited resources for foods. Uh, so pasta, rice, potatoes, those are cheap fast food that's all cheap um, and a lot of them had personal support workers that would cook for them so they were getting what the support cooker was cooking like yeah. our support worker cooking like there there was no elaborate meals going on um, and a couple summers ago like I had a cauliflower was 10 bucks like produce wow. is, was pricey yeah so um, so like out, outside of the city, sure, you can go to great farmer's markets yeah. and get deals. But when you have both your legs amputated like you're, and you're in a wheelchair bound and you don't have support, like it, you're not going out to those farmer's markets. You're bound by what's close by or what people bring you. So it was just easier for them not to eat. And that was a really big driving factor too. We're like, okay, we see it with Ramadan. We see these people do really well, and then we don't really know how to help all these patients with their diet, uh, exactly given their socioeconomic status. So let's just fast them. And it, it worked really well. Like fasting is a heck of a lot easier if you're low carb and keto. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not impossible. Um, for the, it certainly wasn't impossible for these patients and they had a lot of motivation, like we're like facing amputations, facing dialysis. Um, so they were highly motivated and I think that motivation helped override the hunger issues they experienced. You know, not losing a limb can be a good motivator, right? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's real scary stuff. And every now and then I start to work with these like younger, like individuals online and um and some of them in the toronto area and it, it's tough like you don't realize what the always what the consequences of diabetes are so i would sometimes invite them into the clinic or into the dialysis unit to talk to some of my younger patients who said gosh like if i could have gone back like i wouldn't be blind right now or i wouldn't oh, wow. be on dialysis right now or like i would be able to have a family and i i can't like um so it it's tough like these consequences of diabetes are, are really terrifying so and these patients they, they were at the edge um if not even a little bit over the edge so motivation was was super high but even in toronto like healthy or unhealthy like the i think the whole concept of fasting just wasn't that um like foreign because yeah. of the diversity in our city which you know really helped us i think establish ourselves and, and show people that hey you know this is possible like we can do it in toronto we can do it in salt lake city we can do it anywhere yeah well and so you guys have i mean b before you guys came along there wasn't a lot of i guess research about fasting or 
really a lot of information that people could get. So it's been really awesome to be able to point people over to, well, it was IDM. Now it's fasting. But I guess it's kind of whatever nested. I, and it's funny. My first introduction to Dr. Jason Fung was actually I found an article about the Dawn phenomenon. And I started reading through I'm like, who is this guy? This is great stuff. Um, but so... A lot of people worry that fasting isn't safe. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the safety of fasting? Yeah, absolutely. So there are certain circumstances where you wouldn't want to fast. So if you were extremely malnourished, and I'm not talking in the sense of having like lower body fat, like we work with pro athletes that have like 9% body fat. But I'm talking like very malnourished, like if you're a female and perhaps stop having your menstrual cycle um, or if you have a lot of severe nutrient deficiencies. Now, we don't really see that in North America. Usually people are quite overnourished. <laughs> um, so so that's, um, that's often eliminated, but something to take into consideration. Yeah. And you don't necessarily want to be fasting if you're pregnant or breastfeeding but that doesn't mean that you need to eat eight times throughout the day either you can definitely be mindful of you know having two or three meals throughout the day but you wouldn't want to do longer fasting um during those times but other otherwise like the the myths are are, are sort of all over the place i do understand the concerns when people are are fearful of hypoglycemia, mm -hmm. especially if they have reactive hypoglycemia or if they have uh, are on diabetic medications. Um, so if you're on diabetic medications, especially insulin, sulfonylureas, or SGLT2 inhibitors uh, like Invokana or Jardians, you should work with your doctor and let them know that you're fasting to, so you can come off of it safely. If you're on insulin, most doctors will prefer ascribe you a sliding scale. So if your blood sugar is between oh, okay. uh, this number and that number, you take this much insulin. Um, it, so that's, the, you know, that's a big concern. If, um, if you're reactive hypoglycemic, it's just a matter of taking fasting a little bit more slowly, but fasting actually helps a lot of the time. That happened to me. I was completely reactive hypoglycemic all of the time, up and down all day long. Um, and fasting totally leveled that out for me, which has been a phenomenal. Uh, and we see it all of the time too. So, um, so I definitely understand if you're on diabetic meds, you should definitely work with your doctor. In terms of like muscle loss, like a lot of people think that they're going to like waste away muscle, but I don't think people understand what body fat is. Body fat is stored fuel. That's its whole purpose. And uh, this analogy I'm about to share is it's from Jason, but I think is brilliant. Um, like if you're in a cabin in the woods in the winter and you have a hundred pieces of chopped firewood on your porch and you want to make a fire because it's cold outside, what are you going to use to make the fire? The chair. Are you going to go? Absolutely. <laughs> right? Like, are you going to hack up your chair, your sofa, your coffee table to make the fire? Or are you just going to use the fire logs that are there that would the fire? Um, like, it'd be really dumb to hack up furniture. Furniture is expensive. <laughs> and I've yeah. learned that as I've gotten older and <laughs> become a homeowner. <laughs> it's pricey. Um, so like your muscle mass, like that stuff's expensive. It's that fancy sofa. It's that nice dining table. Your fat is just the fuel logs. So if you got plenty of body fat, you have plenty of fuel. And a lot of people, uh, the, the science of fasting just isn't um, there to help them understand it. So when you deplete glycogen stores, your body um, activates your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, so this is this is your flight or flight nervous system, and the activation of it does cause your body to produce counter-regulatory hormones, and these are a good thing. So counter-regulatory hormones, one of them is noradrenaline, which helps so you access your body fat, burn it, maintain your metabolic rate. So this is uh, one of the reasons why fasting is superior to calorie restriction diet because mm -hmm. you don't get that in the calorie restriction diets. Um, and then you get uh, you get a little bit of cortisol, which is not detrimental because that cortisol actually helps you perform gluconeogenesis. Yeah. 
because your body does need a little bit of glucose. So that is your friend during a fast. But you also get human growth hormone production, which is really cool. Like we produce a ton of it when we're kids, but like in adulthood, <laughs> it stops. And then you know we're we're prone to like losing our muscle mass as we age and bone mass, especially in women as we get older. Um, but this human growth hormone production helps us rebuild that lean mass, the muscle and the bone. And you don't grow during the fast but when you re-enter the feeding cycle you've got that high human growth hormone from the fast and then when you start eating you get like amino acids from the protein that you eat mm -hmm. and you get a little bit of insulin secretion and really the combination of those three things are like the the trifecta of helping you like put on muscle mass so like not only are people losing body fat, they're actually getting stronger. So you get stronger during your fast. And even people who are pretty lean, like these pro athletes that I've worked with, um, yeah, sure, okay, they break down some protein, some muscle when they're fasting, but they produce all this human growth hormone. And then like they definitely, they, they chow down on steak and like protein when they start to eat. And sure enough, they, they regain all of that muscle mass. And some of them have actually Actually increase their lean mass through consistent fasting um, so I think that muscle mass like the starvation they're gonna break down their muscles that's that's not the case so do you want to ask Mike's question um, yeah how exactly do you know if you're insulin resistant this is a good <laughs> good question um, so I can tell because I'm fat no <laughs> <laughs> So your waist to hip ratio is a good indicator. In general, you want your waist um, to be less than half uh, in inches to be less than half of your height in inches. Um, but that's not always the case. We can have a lot of visceral fat that can be pretty misleading. Um, so that's fat inside the organs. So like skinny fat. Yeah. Um, Thin on the outside, so fat on the inside, right? Yeah, yeah. So usually, like, there's some cholesterol markers you can look at, like low HDL and high triglycerides. The ratio of, of uh, HDL to triglycerides is a good one to look at. Um, other things, you could check your fasting. Insulin level doesn't really tell you how insulin resistant you are, but if it's very high, you know your body's definitely overproducing it. Um, there, I think, like, the gold standard is doing a craft test. And the craft test is it's identical to the oral glucose tolerance test almost. Um, but instead of checking your glucose response over the course of two hours, you check your insulin response over the course of two hours. Now, it's, it's tough to find a doctor who will order that test for sure. Um, but I do think even just in general okay eat something and see what your blood glucose levels are two hours after you eat and if they're like far above 90 or far above five millimoles per liter whatever units you're talking in um, then that's not cool like you want your blood sugar levels to be coming back down to the normal range so that's usually what we do there are some funny sc scores like the HOMA IR score is really kind of dumb uh, mm -hmm. it takes a uh, glucose and insulin ratio in the calculation, but uh, insulin is pretty variable, so it's not a consistent or reliable measure of insulin resistance. And then if you get one of those fancy lipid profiles, the NMR lipo profiles, they give you an insulin resistance score. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you how many of my patients have like a perfect IR score and are like super insulin resistant. Oh. So <laughs> that's that's a terrible measurement. So look at the HDL, look at the trigs, um, and then see how your your blood glucose uh, rebounds two hours after you eat something, especially something starchy or carby. Okay. Great. Uh, there's another question. What's a good fasting goal for someone who has never fasted before? Like, how would you start? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're already low carb or keto, I imagine if you're watching this, you're at least pretty curious yeah. about it. Um, you can probably just jump into something that you like a little bit more aggressive that you feel comfortable with. So a lot of people, low carb and keto already aren't eating breakfast because they're just not feeling that hungry. Wait, there was so breakfast? Can... I completely forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, who, like that, that's like, I think the first thing to go and when you go keto, you just can't eat. 
the breakfast. Um, but so try cutting out lunch about three times a week and really trying to cut out snacking. Uh, if you're someone who's just a little like pretty leery about fasting or you're not really on the keto or low carb wagon yet where it might be easier, then we go back to like the leave it to beaver days, you know, like when the beeves uh, wanted a snack before dinner and June mama cleaver said no. Yeah. And if he wanted more food after dinner, well, he didn't eat enough of like meat on his plate. So go back to the basics, cut out snacks, go to your three meals a day, try to clean up those meals to at least make them look more like real food base or reduce the carbs if you can. Once that feels easy, then cut out breakfast and we'll do, we'll do what's called like a 16 or 18 hour fast where you're just eating lunch and dinner. And then once that becomes easy, cut out lunch and then, and then do the fast from dinner to dinner three times a week. And once that becomes easy, scale, scale it up to skipping dinner and going the whole day. And you gotta think of fasting like a muscle, right? Like, so most of us have been eating nonstop for like the last 20 years, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Just nonstop. Uh, at least my mid-20s. Just nonstop. Like, um, so like we're eating many times throughout the day, our fasting muscles are weak. So sometimes just going from like lunch to dinner can be a big challenge. But over time with consistent practice, fasting becomes easier. Uh, the same, same thing happened to me. I thought 18 hours was impossible, but I've done 11 days and with no problem. Oh. Um, so it gets time with consistent practice. Like you can't fast get easier you got to think of it as a therapeutic treatment and you've got to got to try to practice it consistently if you only went to the gym like twice a month you're probably not going to be that much stronger uh or have better mobility by the end of the year yeah. but if you go to the gym three times a week week in and week out for you know a good 80 percent of the year then by the end of the year you're, you're going to be stronger and it's the same thing with fasting the same approach with developing that fasting muscle that's fantastic um Shannon says on a keto diet and doing the 42 hour fast um, in, with intermittent fasting is autophagy effectively obtained. So I guess before we even get into that, can you tell us what autophagy is? Yeah, so autophagy is, is a physiological phenomenon that's pretty darn cool. Uh, so in autophagy, we see some cellular recycling. So when you are not giving your body um, like these nutrients, this energy, your body will actually start to perform some cellular recycling. So you'll see old or damaged cells and proteins be broken down and then the body will create new cells from them. So they're not creating like entirely new cells, like your old cells don't go away and like new cells magically appear in autophagy, um, your body will utilize those old cells to m patch them up, fix them up, and make them better, and you'll get new cells. Uh, so that is a process of autophagy, which is really cool because uh, it's got a lot of potential for disease-fighting properties like uh, cancer prevention, neurological disease prevention, or healing like MS, Parkinson's. Um, so it's a big reason why I fast. I've got some damage to my adrenal glands mm -hmm. and I want to see if like I can have like brand spanking new looking <laughs> adrenal glands. Um, Get them shiny. <laughs> right? Like really like polish them off nice. Um, so so that, like, that is a, a motivation um, of mine to continue to fast. So that's what a, autophagy um, is, and that's why someone might want to experience autophagy. Also, too, during a fast, a lot of people want to experience autophagy to see that uh, extra skin go away as they lose the body fat, um, that connective tissue that was there to hold the body fat. What your body will do in autophagy is it will break it down and it will utilize those uh, the protein and the amino acids to help build you up elsewhere. Um, well, so and that, and that connective cool. tissue, if you do a DEXA scan, that even shows up as lean body mass, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. So if, if you are losing a lot of weight and you're fasting, you're having autophagy, it will show up that you're losing lean body mass. But it's the kind of lean body mass you want to lose, so. Yeah, there there are some caveats to the DEXA scan, for okay. sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're talking about autophagy. So what's the best way to achieve 
autophagy? So there, there are many ways, and I actually think that, or not many ways, there are a few ways, and I think the combination of them all is pretty, can produce something pretty magical. So you can, through intensive exercise, absolutely oh. achieve autophagy. Um, you can, through uh, a ketogenic diet, achieve autophagy, but you actually achieve a amount of autophagy in a fasted state. Um, and then when you combine all three, I think that's just golden. Um, but with, with fasting, so once you, uh, you sort of fast away the foods that you most recently ate, uh, and you get into a deeper state of ketosis, we, we see autophagy really sort of rev up. Now, this is like, like the million dollar question that I am asked all the time is how many hours of fasting do you need to be before you experience autophagy? And it's, it's different. So uh, most of the data we have now is not necessarily from a low carb or ketogenic population. Ah. So, okay. so like, like not our clinic data, we don't measure autophagy. That's fancy stuff. <laughs> so, so, but like most of the research that's been published on it, um, so most individuals start to experience autophagy it's sort of around like the 24 hour mark, sometimes a little bit longer. So this is why for individuals that are you know struggling with their diet, like they're keto some days, low carb other days, some, some weeks they have like old flashbacks to their standard North American diet. So it's, it's still, diet's a journey. My diet's been like a, a real evolution over the last decade. Um, so I, I'm there with everybody. But usually if they're trying to lose skin along, we'll try to push them towards 30 or 36 hour fast or, or longer uh, on an intermittent base or the occasional longer fast than stopping them at 24 hours. Um, so... So that's, we have found that to be just in general, sort of like the sweet spot for getting, seeing the skin reduction. And, and that to us is the only way in the clinic we've been able to measure autophagy to a certain extent is by skin reduction. So usually most people, the 36 to 42s, like we're seeing like 150 pounds, 180 pounds, 220 pounds of weight loss, and we're not seeing loose skin. And most people are doing somewhere between I'd say about 30 and 42 hours of fasting about three times a week in those scenarios so we know autophagy is is for sure happening yeah. um but with that being said if someone's pretty keto if someone's doing regular activity at, at higher intensities um if someone's fat adapted meaning that the, their body's really great at fueling on fat uh, as compared to like that they don't have a whole lot of glucose fuel um then yeah it's definitely possible to be in autophagy much earlier than 24 hour mark i think um we just don't have fully like the science on that yet uh on our team at the fasting method our autophagy expert is cardiologist dr nadira lee oh, yeah. and he's got some cool yeah he just joined us it's super cool um he's got some great youtube videos on autophagy i highly recommend anyone interested in the subject check them out okay now when we we actually uh joined you for Fasting Friday, I think mm -hmm. it was, at Keto Fest a couple of years ago. And that was where I first heard you talking about a 36-hour fast. And I didn't get the concept at first, but it's just that you eat dinner and you don't eat anything for a day and then you eat breakfast, right? <laughs> <laughs> the math of it sounds uh, sounds weird. Yeah. Um, but... It's you're just going one day fast, one day eat, one day fast, one day eat. So okay. it's going from like dinner on Sunday to breakfast on Tuesday, just as you said, Chris. Okay, so th and that that's a lot easier to grasp. And so you were saying like <laughs> uh, two or three times a week. Is that what you typically do with your people? Yes. So two. And then we tend to have like a third flexi day, um, and that's what what I did. Like Monday and Wednesdays, I could always fast for the entire day. But Fridays, it depended if I had a social event in the evening, I wouldn't pass it up. But if I was just going to go home and hang out with a book or Netflix, um, then I would I would just fast through the evening. Yeah. So sometimes it would be two forty twos and a twenty four, or three forty twos, just depending on the week. Okay. A 42-hour fast, How, what does that look like? Oh, so even more math. Um, so <laughs> it, 
It's the exact same as a 36, just on your eating days. Instead of having three meals, you have two meals. Okay. So instead of breaking your fast at, say, Tuesday breakfast, you'd break it at Tuesday lunch. Okay. That's that's way – that's super easy. Um, yeah. uh, we had a question someone wanted to know. Is a 172-hour fast – more effective he said better but I, I that's kind of a funny word mm -hmm. than 324 hour fasts like where were you yeah, yeah sorry <laughs> I, got, I got overly excited here um <laughs> so that i'm asked questions of like comparing the 72 often i would say a 72 hour fast is more effective than 324 hour fast really? based mm -hmm. on my clinical observations so, okay. um, but is a 72 hour fast better than 336 or 42 hour fast? I don't necessarily think so. Not okay. that it's worse, but that not that it's better. I think they're pretty much on par with one another. A uh, reason why I would recommend a 72 over say 336 hour fast is usually uh, in like with women. That's right. So women always have this big hunger hurdle, more so than men, on the first day of the fast. Uh, so women, when they do like intermittent fasting, they often find it overwhelming because they always feel like they're restarting at the top of that oh, mental hurdle. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So not everyone. Like um, like me personally, I really loved intermittent fasting at the start because I just I that's knowing I was eating the next day like helped me get through the hours faster. Um, but for a lot of women, they just say, "Hey, if we start the fast, can we just stick? Like, I'd rather do seventy two <laughs> hours than do three intermittent days." And there's a hormonal reason for that. So I like men can absolutely do seventy two hour fast. Right. Um, often, if someone's someone's doing 72s and they hit a plateau, we'll do like 336s. If they're doing 336s and hit a plateau, we'll do a 72. And just changing them up often proves to be really effective for busting through plateaus. Okay. Well, and, um, how how it, how safe is it to do multiple 72-hour fasts? Is that the sort of thing you want to break up with a couple of weeks, or? Well, a lot of people will do it like every week. Oh, really? They'll do 172. Yeah. And then a lot of times too, like if they do a 72 from say Sunday night to Wednesday night, so they're fasting Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they'll often do like maybe a 24 or a 36 like on Friday um, just to help you know, balance out the week a little bit. Uh, and I, it was a strategy that I started to employ at, at one point too. I, I love my intermittent fast, but once fast, my fasting muscle was strong, I got like really annoyed about grocery shopping. Like I didn't have time <laughs> to shop that much to keep food fresh around my fast. So I just said, uh, uh like this is it. So I'm going to fast from Sunday night to Wednesday night. And then like, I'll get my groceries sorted out. And then I, then that way I eat food and it doesn't go bad. And then I get sick of eating after four days of eating, which makes it really easier to get back into a fast. Um, so, <laughs> so, and I actually did that for, for quite a, quite some time. Um, but yeah, we have lots of people that choose that as their base fast every week. Okay. Well, now that's um, what well, this comes to a, an important topic. You can't just use fasting for calorie restriction, right? Well, it's, it's totally different than calorie restriction. Um, like when you do calorie restricted diets, uh, you're like you are still consuming adequate calories that your body can survive on. Mm -hmm. um, so it slows down metabolic processes. So uh, if so, if you look at calories sort of as an energy budget, and you and you slash the budget by fifty percent. Well, then you'll just you'll slash spending from your respiratory system and your cardiovascular system, your reproductive system, your cognitive system, um, and then your your body will still be surviving, but like in a much poor quality of life. And this is why people on calorie restriction diets experience brain fog and don't feel good and develop other health issues because their organs are being like told to run at like 50% capacity, if like depending on how much calorie restriction they're doing from their, their metabolic rate. Um, and then their metabolic rate comes down to meet that new energy budget, which makes it really easy to gain weight if they increase their caloric intake. So there's just like a whole host of issues with it. 
But with fasting, <laughs> like you're you're not eating calories. So your body's got to come up with this energy retrieval system. And this is something that we were designed to do yeah. since the beginning of mankind. So this is where those counter-regulatory hormones come in that produce the human growth hormone, that have a little bit of cortisol, that produce that noradrenaline to help access the fat stores and maintain the metabolic rate. So like in a fasted day, when you're tapping into your fat store, like you're running at regular capacity. Your body's not um, not necessarily slashing any any bigger cost here. Well, we and have to go really hunting big. for the saber tooth tigers. I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, it's so funny. A, a woman posted in our forum today that she's been like after this house fly for like weeks now. And she's, I think she's doing a 72 hour fast. It could be wrong. I, I don't remember the exact details, but she's now in the fast and she was able to get that house fly today. <laughs> and so she posted about like how fasting really does help your hunting. <laughs> got that fly. Awesome. Well, I like to say I, that I, I, our bodies are really smart and they know the difference between not enough and nothing. Yeah. So. Uh, absolutely. It's a big, uh, big difference. So uh, we had a question this morning uh, when we were doing our live stream this morning. Someone wanted to know what would be a good way to break a fast? And I guess that kind of depends on how long you've been fasting, right? Yeah. So um, there are people who can appear to break their fast. Uh, any duration or anything. We had one clinic patient who did about 120 days of fasting, and um, we had come up with like this really elaborate like breakfast plan for this guy. Um, but I think he was walking his dog in his neighborhood, and he smelt someone cooking bacon, and he went home and ate like a pound of bacon, <laughs> and that's how he broke his fast. And like he was completely fine; like he had zero digestive issues. And then he figured since he was fine with that he would just eat whatever like he ate he ate uh keto but he would just like eat with whatever he wanted in the keto wheelhouse and he had no issues wow. like power to this man um but some people experience um like gastrointestinal issues like bloating gas diarrhea uh loose stools when they break their fast usually this um phenomenon goes away within a couple of weeks if you stick with the fasting consistently. So we have some dietary recommendations. Um, like we Nuts and seeds and eggs seem to be problematic foods for not everybody. Oh, really? Like eggs? You, I didn't think that yeah. would be the case. They're pretty tough to digest. But hey, um, if you guys are doing your 72-hour fast and you break your fast with a dozen eggs and you feel awesome, then rock on with the eggs. I, I'm not I telling you. I think we're going to go to Buffalo Wild Wings. But. <laughs> that, that's, I almost always break an extended fast with wings. Okay. So that is an awesome. All. Um, but so eggs and uh, so if you are struggling, eggs, nuts, and seeds, be careful of um, tougher to digest meats. So like beef, lamb, uh, those can be a little bit more complicated to digest, which is why I just said I almost always break my fast with wings because poultry, like even the fat, like on the, the skin as not breaded, like that is perfect. Um, it's a great meal. So we'll recommend like fatty or poultry like wings um, or fish if people are really struggling. No raw vegetables if you're strugg struggling and, and you do incorporate them in your diet. Um, so just make sure they're cooked. You can absolutely cook them in fat. That's not a problem. Uh, so we sort of keep the meal like very simple for that first meal. But usually by the second meal, people can start to incorporate um, more uh, like I'll, I'll end the seven day fast with my wings. But like my next meal is like a fatty ribeye and I have no issues. Oh, wow. So um, so that usually by the second meal your system's back up and running again. Uh, sometimes uh, people do need a little bit of probiotics. We have found that to be helpful in certain cases where uh, changing the meal wasn't enough on its own. Uh, and sometimes in Hashimoto's patients, um, they they struggle with a little bit of an overactive GI system mm -hmm. and not even, 
suspected Hashimoto's or hyperthyroid. Um, so sometimes taking selenium supplementation sort of as a last resort. Always make sure you get blood work done before you take any sorts of supplements like that. But um, we found that in some rare cases to be quite effective too. Wow. Okay. Uh, we have a, a viewer said, did she say 120 days? <laughs> yeah, he, he came into the clinic um, and he said, I'm going to be your, your rock star patient. You just wait and see, Missy. <laughs> <I was laughs> okay. Like, okay. It's a bit presumptuous. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he, so we, we actually saw him weekly in the clinic. Um, he had a tremendous amount of common sense. He was actually so diabetic that it took almost, I think, five weeks to get him off insulin. Um, his sugars were that high, even faster. I'm sorry, but uh, let's put this into context. It took almost five weeks. That's such a long time compared to... Diabetes is a progressive disease for which there is no cure. Yeah. Well, so I guess I'm used to seeing people come off insulin in like a, week. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, and it, it's it's pretty cool too. Like you can most people that we work with are off diabetic medications between six and twelve months, wow. and just thinking that it takes ten to fifteen years to even like develop like pre-diabetes, borderline diabetes, like six to 12 months, that's pretty cool turnaround time. Um, and I still think like, even with myself, like I, I practice what I preach to the point that, you know, I'm, I'm almost obnoxious. Like, and my husband wasn't like fully committed to this lifestyle. Like, I don't know, like if like anyone would be able to marry me. Um, so <laughs> So, but I still see like health improvements and it's cool. Like, it's just really cool. I don't know if it's the autophagy, what it is, you know, growing up on the happy meal diet, which was how I grew up. Um, I, I don't know. It's cool. So I think there's like a real like long-term health journey, but yeah, if you can squash this chronic progressive disease in like a year, whew, why not? Right? Yeah. Well, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, you don't want to go see Nadia unless you want to get pregnant, right? <laughs> Coach Nadia, or Dr. Padiguana, um, she's a wonderful, she's a naturopathic doctor um, turned fasting coach because she realized that most of her patients' ailments could be treated with fasting and low carb. Uh, and especially fertility issues. So she's someone who had a more or less biohack um, her pregnancies through low carb and keto and through doing those diets, she naturally found herself fasting and then drawn to the science of fasting. So she started with us as a fasting coach and just because um, like she's she speaks a lot about PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and her journey with it. Uh, she's presented about it. She wrote a book with Dr. Fung called The PCOS Plan, phenomenal book. Um, so women who had come to our program looking for help with PCOS, we would just direct them to Nadia, Nadia's way. She loves working with these yeah. these particular patients or clients. And um, yeah, they, they were getting pregnant. Like it was <laughs> like spring heat all, all year long. Um, so she, Nadia is the creator of many fasting method um, babies on our Aww. team. It's so exciting. Um, so we love uh, love that this happens. I mean, not not everyone is as enthused yeah, yeah, later true. on. In <laughs> <laughs> but they're enthused to to uh, you know PCOS is something that I've I'm never going to experience. Mm -hmm. But I've heard so many people talking about, it, and it is debilitating. Uh, not just the physical aspects, but the mental aspects, and to be able to turn that around. We were actually talking about this uh, at the dinner table the other day and one of our daughters is like do people not know that they, this can be taken care of i'm like no they just want to take a pill yeah and the, like so they you typically prescribe metformin if the symptoms are um a little bit more moderate mm -hmm. um and I, like it's helpful a little bit uh and then once the symptoms become more severe the, the medication <laughs> Become, bless you. Um, the medication becomes more complicated. Like, just 
not as good. And then especially if you're trying to get pregnant, like the stuff that they put you on is pretty crazy. Um, I was so fortunate that like in my youth, I had mild symptoms of PCOS. And I think that for me, it was just because I ate garbage when I ate, but like I was never really obsessed with food until my mm. mid twenties. Um, like I, I ate cause it was time. Like my mom said it was time to eat. <laughs> and that, that was, that was the story of my childhood. Um, but in my mid twenties, I became obsessed with always wanting to eat as my insulin got really wild and I developed diabetes, but like I was so lucky, but yeah, Chris, like, like you said, like these symptoms can be completely debilitating and heartbreaking. Breaking. Like when Nadia wanted to start a family, like all of the the terrible stuff that she had to go through and, and the struggles with her and her husband and the heartbreak, like, gosh. Um, and then just the, the regular, like the day-to-day stuff, like it, it's literally diabetes of the ovaries. Yeah. And like people know like how detrimental diabetes is to them. Like it just totally wrecks habit and, and it affects you on so many emotional levels, especially for young girls who have it bad too. So Margie wanted to know, if, do you guys track ketones or anything when you're doing fasts or is it mostly just glucose? Um, so ketones, um, uh, like I, I love ketones, uh, <laughs> they're, like they're primary fuel source for your body, big fan, but they change a lot throughout the day. Yeah. And like, if you lift something heavy, if you're active, your body's going to utilize those ketones. So when you check them, they're going to be down and that's not always a bad thing. Like if I do weight training and a fasted state and I see my ketones go from like 3.5 to like one, like I'm excited because I'm like, hey, my muscle. That's like, what it's I for, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and you want your, your body to start using them effectively. And sometimes too, when people are, are pretty consistent with style, you know, first it takes them a while to produce ketones and then they're producing a lot of ketones and then their body starts to use the ketones. So the level starts to come down in a more moderate range, which is, which is quite good. Um, but then that, that makes them nervous. Oh, yeah. And then sometimes like we have lean mass hyper responsors that just like absorb, like use all those <laughs> ketones immediately. Um, so they don't necessarily see it on a glucon or a ketone meter. Um, so there, and then like T3 there, like thyroid, if you have too little T3, like you have a poor conversion issue or just like you're even deficient in T4 to start with, you don't necessarily see like this crazy ketone production and um or if you're on t3 therapy and natural desiccated thyroid uh, but if you're on too much of it too or a lot of it 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 might slow down your ketones so it's so like ketones are variable i i love like i track mine but i don't have this emotional tie to it like i like tracking the trends to see what i'm like in the morning to see what i'm like after certain foods or physical activity um so i like i love like i have a biosense i have a keto mojo i i'm all about tracking it for my own health um sometimes we will encourage people who are more sedentary and are struggling to lose fat we will start checking their ketones because we would suspect that um, activity is not playing a major role in their cases. So in our clinic, because and not until recently can we get the Keto Mojo test strip shipped oh, here. Oh, yeah. And in, yeah, and in Canada, um, the Keto Mojo, or no, the Keto Meter is the, the Abbott um, Freestyle Precision Neo, and those strips are 275 each. Mm. Um, they're not covered by most insurers either. So we just never really went there with our clinic patients, but on online, like we encourage um, people to experiment with it. Sometimes we'll, we'll absolutely say, yeah, you've got to start checking your ketones, especially if in, you're in a place where you can access the mojo. Now we can in Canada, and it's actually approved by FSA and HSA, I think, spending accounts in the US. Um, it's an approved device, so which makes it even more affordable for a lot of Americans, I, I believe, uh, to get. So it's cool to see the data, um, uh, and it, it's cool for people who I think hit hit rockier patches too with their weight loss journey. Did you want to ask Deb's question? 
Um, yes, uh, Deb said, speaking of spouses, any suggestions on how to fast when your spouse and friends think you're crazy <laughs> and will starve or get sick if you fast even when carrying dozens of extra pounds? So it's tough on the spouse front uh, of things. So I was pretty lucky. I started fasting after a divorce, <laughs> so I didn't, have, I didn't have a spouse, but I actually, I was... Um, living with family while going through that divorce when I first started fasting. My father is a, a lawyer and I thought he was going to try to get power of attorney over me and, and get me sent to an institution oh for my. what he thought was an eating disorder. Um, but luckily for me, he got busy with a court case and forgot that <laughs> I was fasting. Um, but it, it was tough and so like, I, I hate to say it, but I did <laughs> fib a lot like oh mom no I you know I ate uh, before I left work or um, I'm going to grab breakfast on the way to the clinic or you know socializing a little bit with friends uh, and sort of saying the same thing oh I have fasting blood work tomorrow I'm going for an ultrasound so I have to be fasted um, so I think a lot of people thought I had some chronic health issue, but I started getting healthier and usually like once you start to get healthier, people start to ask questions. Um, so, you know, Dr. Fong, Jason, his, he always says the first rule of fasting club is Don't not to tell anyone that. you're fasting. <laughs> Um, so trying to, trying to skirt around it, uh, I, I like just changing it up. I'm not stacking as much. Um, I'm not going to eat late at night. Uh, I have a funny anecdotal story. So I went to see my primary care. I only see her every couple of years. Um, and she said, what type of diet do you follow? And I said, well, you know, I eat lots of grass-fed beef. I eat wild fish. I eat, you know, um, coconut oil. Uh, I eat non-starchy veg and avocado. Well, that all sounds I, like, great. Just, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what she said. But the uh, irony was, she said that, like, so I explained what I ate. And she's like, Oh, I wish everybody ate like you. This is why you're so healthy. Um, and she said, I'm so happy you didn't tell me you're following one of those stupid keto diet trends. And I'm like, what do you think I just explained to you, lady? So when, when, like, when you label things, it makes people uncomfortable. So, you know, I'm not eating as much junk food or I'm not going to eat late at night. Like everybody knows that not eating late at night is good for them. Like absolutely everybody, even though they don't understand the science, they know that. Or I'm not going to snack on as much junk. I'm going to save my appetite for dinner. Yeah. Um, I'm so going to a churrascaria th in three days, and I want to really get my money's worth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think when it comes to spouses, you know, so I've been I've been lucky. I was obviously pretty invested in this lifestyle by the time I, I met my husband uh, or my now husband. Um, but for them, I think. From my experience with, I've, I've worked with over 14,000 people, a lot of them in, in relationships, and it's just finding a pattern that where the other spouse, the fasting's not gonna be thrown in their face too much. So this is one strategy that often works. So if you do 336 or 42s, you're missing three dinners a week with your family or your significant other, and that, can seem like a lot, you know, it's roughly 50% of the time um, that you're not having dinner with them. But something that people will do is instead do two 48 hour fasts a week. Then that way they're only missing two dinners mm. with their spouse. And it's still a great amount of fasting, still gonna get autophagy, all those wonderful things. Um, but you're not like, you're spending like five nights of the week, you know, having dinner with your spouse. And if you can plan those like nights that you might be fasting around those nights that, you know, he might have some sort of extracurricular activity, perhaps like you know, squash game, like on Mondays, like those regular activities, or, you know, he takes your, your, your son or daughter to soccer practice or uh, on those nights, then it really minimizes how much they see you fasting. And it just sort of keeps everything a little bit more even keel in the household. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Um, now, we, we did talk a little bit about this earlier, but so when you're breaking a fast and you, we don't want to do calorie restricting, and I've, I've heard you talk a lot about um, fasting and feasting and the importance of that. 
Yeah, so you want it. <laughs> you don't want to go like, oh, <laughs> like, you know, like it's it's your last supper kind of deal. But you want to eat until you're full. And I don't know necessarily if like feasting is the right word, but why I chose to use it in the in the past uh, and and still do is because particularly a lot of people, men and women, who have done like chronic dieting in the past, like on low fat. Uh, if they did overeat, um, like they were overeating carbs and they associate that with weight gain because that's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that I've worked with in our community are just so petrified of eating till they feel full because to them that means disaster on the scale. It means their pants aren't going to fit the next day. They've done something counterproductive. So we really want people to eat until they feel full, but eat like real foods, eat real fats. You know, um, and I, I respect people have different dietary preferences, but real foods, unprocessed foods, unprocessed uh, fats are so important. Um, and when you eat those, especially the fats to your rate satiation, like you're going to help yourself lose weight, actually. Like you're not going to gain weight. And like people are so hell bent on this calorie. Thing. And it's like, okay, if you have, um, say, uh, you have 150 uh, calories worth of almonds or you have a, a can of soda, which is 150 calories, like if you ask people here, if you eat this handful of almonds, do you think this will help you gain weight or lose weight? And the majority of the population will think of it as a weight loss snack. But if you have this can of soda, people say, oh, no, that will definitely help contribute to weight gain and make my blood sugars go up. They're both 100 and 150 calories. Yeah. So, like, what the hell do the calories have anything to do about it? So it's really the hormonal response. And eating healthy natural fats helps you burn fat. Uh, so that is really important. So eating that to satiation is going to leave you feeling good. So when someone's finishing up a, a fast, you don't really worry about tracking what they're eating. You're talking about eat until you're satisfied, right? Yeah, absolutely. Every now and then there's a, an individual who really feels like they could just keep eating and eating. And when you talk to them, their diet's awesome, right? Like it's, they're, they're having ribeyes, they, you know, they're, they're having chicken wings, they're having bacon and Brussels sprouts. Uh, they're having like really good foods. So every now and then there might be a little bit of satiation issues, like hormonal signaling issues with the, our satiation hormone leptin. So once in a while we find these individuals and maybe we'll set macro um, goals for them for that meal. Uh, just to give them some comfort that it's like, okay, I've eaten a good amount of fat, I've eaten a good amount of protein, I've kept my carbs in a good range if I'm having any at all. Um, so it, it makes them feel comfortable stopping their eating. Um, but it's pretty rare that we come across that, but I'm not going to say we haven't, we haven't seen it. But for the most part, you know, eat, eat until you feel full. Like if that's, two ribeyes that's two ribeyes uh, if it's two pounds of wings if, if it's a head of cauliflower you know rock rock your diet um but eat the real foods uh and eat fat to satiation but if you struggle it's okay to set some macro goals for okay. you to hit too well in talking about okay so fasting uh what can you have when you're fasting i know you talked earlier about fasting is so simple it's it's free you just don't need anything but you have to have something. You have to have salt, right? <laughs> you have to have salt. So water um, first. It can be flat, mineral, carbonated. It can be hot, warm, cold. Like you can get really wild with water. Um, but salt is really beneficial. Salt's like the gateway electrolyte. If you keep your salt levels happy, you keep your magnesium levels happy. And magnesium keeps your other levels happy, like potassium and phosphorus. So salt is sort of the, the key thing. So we really focus on that. We don't mess around with a lot of electrolytes other than magnesium. So salt. So um, getting in salt through your diet, through whatever means you, you find palatable, uh, and then the keto chow fasting drops. That is salt. Like that is sodium. Yeah, I've got these. I've got them everywhere. Um, but they're, they're easy to take. 
And so getting in that salt is really important. When people, uh, so getting towards a fast that is mostly salt and water is the goal. Um, but when you're new to fasting or if you're trying to extend your fast, like really stretch that fasting muscle out, flex it, um, or you're just like struggling for whatever reason, like maybe you didn't sleep very well, you've got some stress going on, um, and you're struggling to get through the fast, then there are some like fasting aids or fasting training meals that you can have. Uh, so broth, like a bone broth or a low carb veg broth uh, that you can make at home uh, is good. But there are some good brands now that you can buy, like Kettle and Fire is a pretty cool um, brand. That's what I will purchase if I'm too lazy to make my <laughs> own. Uh, and then pickle juice, sugar-free pickle juice, like dill pickle juice. Oh, that is like my jam. I, I love that stuff. Um, and it's just a it's just a cool way to like change change things up. I, I'll make like popsicles or ice cubes in the summertime mm -hmm. with it. <laughs> <laughs> it it is good. Um, and then of course like you can have herbal teas or you could even have a black tea, but preferably not add anything to it. Black coffee, of course. Um, if you did need to add a little bit of fat at the start, yeah, absolutely add a little bit of fat. The more fattier the substance, the better. I'm a big fan of coconut fats um, into your coffee if you need it. So coconut milk, coconut cream is really thick though. Um, coconut oil, <laughs> MCT oil, which is uh, the medium chain fats from coconut oil. Um, so those are, those are good fats, uh, but people can add like heavy Heavy whipping cream um, to their coffee or tea as well if they don't have any dairy sensitivities that's perfectly cool and that can help you get going so like when I fast um, I usually do have my morning green tea because I am not a nice person um, <laughs> without it um, and then I just try to keep it to I don't add anything to the green tea, um, but I just try to keep it to like water and my salt sources. Um, but if I'm struggling, um, like I didn't get in enough salt before a gym workout, after the workout, I might chug some pickle juice or have some broth so I can keep carrying on with my fast. Um, so that's how I would like I implement my training wheels or if I really want to get that fast in, but like, gosh, I didn't sleep that well that night. It, it might be a rough day. So I might have some more broth um, to help you know get me through that day or a tablespoon of coconut fat um, just to help give me a boost at that day so that's how we recommend people use the training wheels and when you're brand new to fasting there's no need to really restrict them but the goal is to stop using them unless you really need them in the long run but yeah the base fast is water and salt and usually too we'll recommend a lot of Epsom salt baths or magnesium mm -hmm. supplementation you guys have a great a really great magnesium supplementation it's super pure yeah it's, it's really cool and it's so easy to travel with um, and what I like about it too is it doesn't cause a lot of the GI issues mm. that other magnesium supplements because I think the form of it is just so easily absorbed uh, very similar it's like internal Epsom salt <laughs> sort of um, it's don't don't swallow up in salt water but um, it's 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 got a cool effect like that um, or they like and taking magnesium uh, supplements but I haven't seen magnesium supplements like really perform super well um, but they definitely do help and for individuals where they perform well they, they like I'm talking like the biglycinate the theronate oh, okay. the malate those need like the tablet magnesium supplements um, but I, I take them I take uh, biglycinate I take theronate I take your drops and I do Epsom salt baths um, I really think it's important to get in quite a lot of magnesium and get you can get creative with how you have it Think hedge your bets, take a bit of everything. Um, but the topical application's awesome. And then yours is like a weird internal topical application. <laughs> um, so it's really well absorbed, um, which is great. Whereas like the orals, uh, like the tablets can sometimes not be well absorbed and cause like loose stools and diarrhea and unwanted side effects. Yeah. So, um, hold on a second. So something that Miriam, taught me, hey, I got my two crazy ketos thing here. It's, and this is something that I learned when we were coming back from, I think it was KetoCon. She'll take, and she will 
fill up the straw. Not fill it up. Just just put a whole bunch in there. In there. And, and then, then it goes straight to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you get the... The yucky part. First. It's pretty but strong. But then it's gone. And then it's gone. And then you can drink some more. That's much better. Anyway, I'm not going to put that on top of there. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, have you ever found it's hard to get the right amount of sodium? Like, can you get too much? Do you ever run into that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people need a lot more salt than they think. And about 18% of the population is salt sensitive. But even when they have salt, like it doesn't really raise their blood pressure that much. It doesn't cause them to retain that much more water. Like they're, they're already higher in water anyways. Um, so but most people need salt, especially as like if they go towards a low carb or keto diet and they're doing all this fasting, like they've cut out all this processed junk from their diet. Um, so I find most people like the equivalent sodium of like one and a half teaspoons of salt a day um, is is pretty good but sometimes people need more but yeah you can you can definitely take an extra a uh, few crystals or a few squirts of, yeah. <laughs> of salt um, and so what the, the side effects of higher salt levels can be similar to lower like sluggishness mm. fatigue um, you can get some heart palpitations or you generally feel um, like you, you can bloat up feel very very tired and it's happened to me a couple oh, wow. of times too i just try to try to drink uh water um and to dilute it dilute my system and cause myself to go to the bathroom to get get rid of any extra electrolytes um but uh like it's not you just feel pretty tired and it's just like ah oh, damn it like i probably <laughs> should have cut back a little bit but if you if like if you're not sure, just increase your electrolytes slowly. This actually hasn't happened to me in like five years, oh. um, and the reason why is like I, I pretty much like I'll drink fasty water, salty water throughout the day. So like I'll squirt fasting drops into like my water bottle, and I'll just drink it throughout the day. But I say I start to really crave just plain water, I'm like, okay, like my body is just letting me know and I drink plain water and I'll have maybe like a couple of glasses of plain water and then I, I'm fine and I go back to my like water bottle periodic, salty water bottle yeah. periodically throughout the rest of the day. So I haven't had issues with it and to be honest, like we've never, like it's really rare that someone's like, oh, I think I had too much salt. Um, Usually they say I'm I'm craving like plain water and that's a sign just to like put the salty stuff on the side for like a, a couple of hours, drink some plain water and you're you're perfectly fine. So um, so just make sure you listen to your body. If your body's craving plain, plain water during a fast, then have it. And then once you're feeling, you know, cool, calm. Um, <laughs> um, then you can go back to sort of sipping on some salt, salty stuff if you want. Okay. Well, speaking of going on for hours, we could probably go on for hours, but it's mm -hmm. like 11 o'clock where you're at. So, oh yeah, it's two hours. Past I, <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Thank you so much for oh, your no. time. Um, this was absolutely okay. fantastic. Um, did you have anything you wanted to leave everybody with? I mean, check out the, the fasting method, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Check out the fasting method. But if you're nervous to fast um, or you've been struggling with fasting, my two biggest tips, if you're if you're nervous, just cut out snacks. It makes the world of difference. If, and if you're struggling with a plateau, cut out snacks. It makes a big difference. Um, so those are key. And if you're just struggling, like the fasting days feel like they're weighing down on you, be mindful of your sodium intake. Like actually measure it out. So whether, like whether you're taking salt or you're taking like fasting drops, like count how much sodium you're taking. And almost always, like 98% of the time, people are blown away when they actually do the math of how little salt they're mm. actually taking. They think it's a lot when they reflect on their day, but it's actually not. So don't be a, like don't be afraid to track it and to add more if you feel like you need it. Um, so again, we're a big fan of your fasting drops in our community and and salt salt in general is a pretty cool thing. Well, we made it just for you. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it's it's a cool product, and I, I think a great resource for people who think, okay, this crazy lady from Canada um, is talking about salt. Um, check out the Dr. Jane C. Nicolantonio. He wrote an awesome book called The Salt Fix. Incredibly well referenced. Will blow your mind. Oh, yeah. um, so if you're nervous about like adding in these fasting drops, like I, I can tell you, read his book. It will be a game changer for you. Good stuff. All right. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Um, we hope you have a great day and go to sleep, okay? Yeah, sleep in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye.